So many people now agree that the only way we can avoid the worst effects of climate change is through a swift and large scale transition to renewables. But there's also this school of thought that argues that this alone might not be enough, and instead we have to address the fundamental structure of our economic system and its dependence on continuous economic growth for survival. And it's this idea of needing to shift to a post-capitalist economy that forms the backbone for the term degrowth. And this is exactly what Jason Hickel talks about in his book, Less is More, How Degrowth Will Save the World. Now, in the words of Hickel, degrowth is the planned descaling of energy use in order to bring the economy back into balance with our planet. And this book takes an interesting anthropological approach to critiquing our current economic system. In particular, Hickel explains how the birth of capitalism from movements like artificial scarcity and enclosure have led to an economic system which is inherently wasteful and inefficient. Now he also provides his idea of an alternative economic system, and what's interesting here is that even with the scaling down of our economy, Hickel outlines that by employing certain tactics or policies, we can actually solve climate change whilst also continuing to improve people's quality of life and even ending things like inequality. Now the book sort of addresses the problem from three different angles. It starts off by addressing the current fundamental problem of capitalism, which is this idea of continuous growth or the pursuit of ever increasing GDP. And this is really the main argument behind degrowth. Capitalism is not, as many people think, defined by markets and trades. These are things that, as Hickel points out, existed long before capitalism. Instead, he makes the argument that it's defined by its reliance on constant growth and cycles of accumulation. As it currently stands, growth is essential for companies to maintain their market share, and if they don't grow, they'll simply be swallowed up by the competition or lose interest from investors. Now, the book states that in order to prevent recession, we need to grow our economies by 2 to 3% every year. The problem with growth here in environmental terms is that we have not yet seen empirical evidence of being able to decouple our GDP and resource consumption. Now, the book argues there's this fundamental problem with GDP in that it's a bad metric for economic development. The focus on GDP in particular has led to an ignorance of other factors that contribute to people's well-being like education and healthcare. And it's this globally shared goal of growing GDP that leads to ever-increasing consumption of resources and energy. Now, secondly, Hickel explains that the roots of the problem lie in its origins, namely things like colonialism and the enclosure movements across Europe. And he highlights three main examples which were foundational to the birth of capitalism. To start with, we have the enclosure movement and the creation of artificial scarcity. Now, we're told that the rise of capitalism marked the end of feudalism and led to the prospect of prosperity for all, but the book argues that this is not the case. There was indeed an end to feudalism, but it didn't come as a result of capitalism. Instead, Hickel talks about this period between 1350 and 1500, which was described as a golden age in Europe, and it came by way of a revolution based on a self-sufficient egalitarian society. It was made up of free farmers with free access to the commons, like land for pasture grazing and shorter working days. People live very much based off subsistence lifestyles, taking what they needed, but always in the spirit of reciprocity. Now, that was until the powerful people under which these farmers had once worked brought it to a brutal end. The commons were fenced off for private use and farmers were evicted from their lands. Instead, people now only had temporary leases on land which were allocated based on productivity. And the effect of this was that it incentivized over-intensive farming, depleting the soil of its nutrients and so ending this reciprocity which had once existed between people and the land. And what the book argues here then is that by denying people the basic needs they needed to survive, whether it be land for farming or rivers for water, they had no choice but to work in return for wages. And it was this cheap labour that became, as Hickel puts it, the engine for capitalist growth. This is in essence the theory of artificial scarcity. It's not that there was actually a shortage of resources, 
but it was just used by the rich as a means of controlling the poor and forcing them to shift from their subsistence lifestyles into this industrial workforce. Now, secondly, Hickel talks about the role of colonization in the industrial development of Europe. Not only did colonization provide the surplus money that was invested into the industrial revolution, but it also provided the raw materials that drove it. Cotton and sugar were key to the industrial revolution, for example, neither of which grew in Europe, and mines and plantations were powered by indigenous Americans or enslaved Africans. Now, Hickel actually puts this relationship between colonization and the industrial revolution very elegantly in his book, stating that it hinged on commodities that were produced by slaves, on land stolen from colonized peoples, and processed in factories staffed by European peasants. The Industrial Revolution provided the foundation for the system of mass production around which modern capitalism revolves. Now another thing the book talks about is that the same enclosure movement that had been enforced across Europe was also inflicted upon the Global South. Just like had happened in Europe, subsistence farmers in colonies were initially reluctant to move away from their self-sufficient lifestyles, even when they were promised wages. And so to solve this, the colonizers employed tactics of enclosure and implemented taxes to give the population no choice but to comply. Now the book also highlights that the problem of colonization is still happening today, albeit in a slightly different form. And what that really boils down to is this idea of atmospheric colonization. Global warming depends on the total stocks of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, not the rate at which it flows in. And what this means is that countries in the global north with vast historic carbon emissions are largely responsible for the climate change we're seeing today, even though they might have successfully limited their current rate of emission. Now, finally, Hegel talks about the emergence of dualist philosophy being fundamental to the emergence of capitalism. During the enclosure movement, the relationship between humans and nature was also simultaneously broken. The Industrial Revolution meant that people moved to cities and were no longer directly dependent on the land. Now, the book mentions multiple philosophers like Rene Descartes and Francis Bacon, who defended this idea that humans were fundamentally separate from nature and instead dominated over it. And it's this rejection of animism, the idea that all forms of life are spiritually interconnected, which opened the gates for the plunder of the world's nature and resources that have occurred with capitalist expansion. Now, the third aspect to the problem with our current economical system, as Hickel puts it, is that this future of green growth is not possible. Green growth is the main counter to degrowth. The proponents of it basically argue that we can continue to grow our economy and use technology and policy instead to reduce our ecological impacts. And so in the book, Hickel counters this with kind of two main arguments. The first being the idea of the Jevons paradox. And the Jevons paradox basically states that once the use of a resource becomes more efficient, it will only lead to increased consumption of that resource. Hickel argues that the current structure of our economy will only use efficiency gains to maximize profits and market share and not to reduce our environmental impacts. Now in the book, Hickel gives the example of recycling. He states that in 2018, the global economy achieved a recycling rate of 9.1%. Two years later, it was down to 8.6%. Now, what he says is that this wasn't because we were recycling less, it's because the waste production was outgrowing the gains in recycling efficiency. The second flaw of green growth mentioned in the book is that many green growth policies, including those in the Paris Agreement, are based on carbon capture and storage, and in particular, this thing called BECS, which stands for Bioenergy with Carbon Capture and Storage. Now, Hickel highlights that the problem here is that whilst on face value carbon capture appears to be an easy solution to implement, it has several big downsides, namely that it reduces land use which could otherwise be used for food and also leads to things like biodiversity loss and soil depletion. And he also makes the argument that we don't yet know how well it will work. And by basing all our kind of climate policy of something which hasn't yet been proven, it's quite a risky strategy.
Now, after spending the whole first half of the book critiquing our current economic system, Hickel luckily does come with a solution of his own. And to start with, he promotes a five-step policy change of ending planned obsolescence, cutting advertising, shifting from ownership to usership, ending food waste, and scaling down ecologically destructive industries. He starts off by giving the example of the smartphone industry. Phones, as many of us will realize, are deliberately made to slow down after a couple of years, to the point where the cost of a repair forces a consumer into buying a new one. Instead, he makes the case for this idea of a right to repair, basically a policy where it would be illegal to produce a product which couldn't be replaced by an average person or a mechanic with easy to source parts and replacements. Now, secondly, he states that we need to limit advertising and stop people from buying things they don't actually need. Hickel gives the analogy that modern advertising in the form of personalized ads is like the fracking of our brains, and companies will seek ever more inventive ways to tap into our subconscious just to sell more of their products. Now, he also gives examples in the book of cities who have been able to successfully introduce policies to cut advertising, and hopefully many others would be able to follow suit. Another of the points Hickel makes is that we need to shift from ownership to usership. And what Hickel really talks about here is that much of the stuff we own, we need, but we actually rarely use. So instead of each individual person owning the same appliance, we should promote schemes where material goods are shared between multiple households instead. Now, the fourth point Hickel makes is that we should end food waste, and he gives the statistic that 50% of food produced each year is wasted. And so by cutting down on food waste, we could theoretically at least half the resources and land required for agriculture while still producing the same amount. Now, finally, he makes the argument that we should scale down ecologically destructive industries. People often misunderstand the arguments behind degrowth as the idea that we have to scale down every single industry, even the ones that make positive contributions to the environment and people's well-being. But what Hickel argues instead is that we should focus on degrowing the industries that cause the most ecological harm and offer the least to our society. He gives the examples of the beef industry and the SUV industry as two of the most harmful to the world, but by no means necessary to human prosperity. Now, alongside this five-step policy change, Hickel also talks about what degrowth would mean for jobs. A lot of people's fears about degrowth stem from this idea that a decline in economic activity would only exacerbate issues of unemployment and poverty. But Hickel addresses this with two main factors. He argues that we should shorten the working week while also introducing this idea of having a global minimum wage. This would allow us to shut down unnecessary industries while redistributing labour among the population. He also gives this idea of a maximum wage policy, saying that, for example, incomes higher than a given multiple of the national wage would face a 100% tax, or specifying a maximum ratio between the salary of executives and the lowest paid employees within a company. What this would mean then is that it would motivate CEOs to raise wages, but instead of just benefiting themselves, they'd benefit everyone within the company. Now, there were many other solutions proposed in the book that I didn't have the time to list here, but these were the ones that really had the biggest impact on me. If you're interested, I'd thoroughly recommend reading the book. I think Hickel's very articulate in the way he explains um, the kind of key principles about degrowth, and whether or not you agree with degrowth, I still think there are lots of valuable insights you can take. As always, I'm Luke, and this was The Upshift.